This is an interview with Sam Barlow, the writer and director of Her Story, which received the Grand Jury Award in NDK 2015. I'm Sam Barlow. I'm a game developer. My first introduction to IndieCade was when uh, I exhibited my game Her Story, and Her Story won the grand prize that year. And that was, I think that was the first stop on the kind of awards run for Her Story. So that was, that was starting to realize that the game was working. Um, and it was a really cool space to, to kind of show off the game and meet other indie devs. How was the shift from corporate to indie? There's a few other indie developers that I know that came from that world of working for publishers, getting that start where you're working on movie tie-ins and uh, Krusty Demons tie-ins. Um, and it's an incredible kind of uh, training program for just getting stuck in and working against horrendous time limits and with all sorts of constraints. Um, so we all kind of felt like having come up through the industry in that way, we had a lot of practical craft. All the people I know with a similar background, we have gone into things in a reasonably risk-averse way. I was directing uh, a game for Square Enix, and we worked on this thing for three years. It was a, a you know a big budget AAA action adventure, uh, very story driven, um, very much my bread and butter. Um, and this was this was like around the time that publishers were moving from, I guess, the PS3 to the PS4 era. Mobile had happened. Uh, publishers were terrified. What does our business model look like? Will people even buy new consoles? You know, very much a fear-driven moment for them. And so that game got cancelled after this intense three years of development. And I did a bit of time after that where working for an independent developer where, you know, you're pitching publishers and stuff, we suddenly realized pitching story-driven stuff, pitching interesting single-player stuff, pitching kind of new types of playing was really hard because the budget suddenly dropped. Like, publishers were looking at mobile and going, well, look, these weird small match three games are making billions of dollars. We want that. Or they'd say, yeah, we want the cool, quirky stuff. That will play really well to this crowd. But here is a very small amount of money to make it. And it seems so perverse to me. I was looking at them. I'm like, well, it seems like we could make these games. But working for a bigger studio, when you factor in overheads and you know start staffing these projects up and adding people in and pushing them across the life of the project, suddenly these things are costing so much money. No one's interested. And even in the case where you could say, if this works, if we're going to triple our money, publishers are like, eh, I don't want to triple <laughs> money on a million-dollar project when I could be making, in theory, you know, millions a day on some game or service thing. And so that was this point where I was getting jealous of the indie scene and seeing developers like Simago, and I'd look at their stuff and I'd be like, wow, that's like two guys made this thing that's really awesome and doing interesting things. And so it became more and more obvious. It, in fact, kind of felt less risky to jump into that world than try and make being a game director of big budget, story-driven things happen. Because it's like there's probably only two being made in the world at any given time, right? So with her story, looked at all the money we had saved up and how much my wife was bringing in and what our mortgage was and did the spreadsheets and was like, okay, I give myself a year to make a thing and that's it. I've got a year to do this. Um, and within that year, I'm going to give myself all the freedom that I've missed in doing what I'm doing normally. So I'm going to do these ideas that seem really interesting to me and would never fly if I was pitching somebody. Um, I'm going to build this thing in a way that's very different. So with her story, I gave myself six months to just research this thing and work on paper, not even touch a prototype, because I was kind of fatigued by, you know, if you have a team of 100 people and you need to bill for those people to justify your studio, you don't take your time planning things. You jump in and, uh, you know, you're making stuff as you're actually building it and people are building characters and locations and gameplay mechanics and you're still figuring the story out. So, yeah, very much her story was there was this strong practicality of going, right, 
I'm going to make something that I can do in a year and finish. And I'd kind of figured out worst case scenario, like I just need to make something interesting. Like I knew particularly uh, the Silent Hill game, the good Silent Hill game that we made, the Silent Hill Shadow Memories. I knew there was a bunch of journalists that really loved that game. And the, the few people that had played it really loved that game. And so it felt like there was enough leverage there that people would care about me going off and making some weird story thing. And, you know, this this was sort of around the time that people were doing Kickstarters and things. So people were still in a position to sort of cash in whatever cool stuff they'd worked on to get a little bit of attention. And there wasn't quite the noise that there is now around just so many different projects. So that was, yeah, that was the plan. And I went off and once I'd kind of come up with the core idea of her story, I felt, I felt like this is interesting to me. Like if someone made this, I would want to play it. And so let's just assume there's a few other people like me in the world that I can somehow reach them. That was kind of my foundation of the plan. Like the weird slash cool thing with her story was reaching an audience that I'd never seen before. Like coming from that traditional publisher world, you're making a game, they're printing it on a disc. And most of my games were back when they were printed on discs, put on discs shipped to GameStop or wherever. And then if the marketing people have done their job, it'll go on a nice shelf placement. Otherwise, it will go at the back of the store and very rapidly be out of there. That was always the dev team's job was the week of release was to go into all the GameStop and uh, HMB in England and those kind of places and uh, move your game <laughs> from the, the fourth shelf up, put it next to the other bigger games um, and try and do it in a way that the store employees wouldn't see you doing it so going from that world to with her story the people who are playing it the breadth of those people the geographical variety just the split in terms of age and gender was awesome to say no look if you go and make a character driven crime piece it will reach an audience that is more varied and interesting than these traditional video games we're making what was your marketing and launch like? I was aware that I was doing everything wrong. Like I was aware and like in the period where I was thinking, do I go and do this? Do I put all my savings into going and making an indie game and, you know, take a step away from the career I've been building? Um, and so I was looking at indie success stories. And at that point there was like a good, there was like an accepted common wisdom of this is how indie games work. You have a cool demo, you take it around all the various shows, you have your booth, you gain some visibility, you develop in public. It was like a, at that point a huge thing of like, this is what indies can do that a AAA can't. Uh, we're going to let people see that into the development process. Uh, you're going to build a fan base before the game is done that's the only way you'll succeed and be able to hit the steam algorithms or whatever there was me working for six months just reading and doing research about police interviews and then when i started to actually build the prototype the the filming of the video was right at the end and so i knew until that was done there was nothing to show people wouldn't even understand what this thing was and even then it was such a uh, a unique story driven thing that is this the kind of thing I can ask someone to come and sit down for five minutes and play in a booth? And what does that do for spoilers and, and all these things? Um, so I definitely knew that all of those were things that were wrong, according to common wisdom. Um, you know, I wasn't building up this head of steam. I wasn't building a fan base of people that had played demos or been part of it. I certainly wasn't going to early access it or anything like that. And I guess there is something reassuring about knowing that at least you're doing things very differently to most people that, Hey, if this works, it's going to, you know, that will be an advantage. If it doesn't work, I'll know what I did wrong. But yeah, I think I just always came back to if I could just finish it and, you know, finishing a game is half the challenge. Right. And I sort of knew that I was being practical enough that I was going to finish this thing. I was giving myself a year and I was going to finish it around. I think it ended up being 14 months, but um, this wasn't going to be the kind of, project that slipped by years 
What inspired the police interview format? Knowing that I wanted to do something in the crime police procedural mystery space, because I'd always pitched publishers that and they'd always said no. And I was like, but this is huge in every other medium. And they're like, yeah. And I kind of early on honed in on the idea of the interview room as being interesting to me. It was like feature of all my favorite cop shows was that moment between the kind of master detective and the criminal and there's the, the psychological back and forth and all the interesting dialogue. But I didn't know what that looked like. And doing the research, I ended up watching tons of, and this was like slightly ahead of the the true crime thing blowing up and just realizing that on YouTube, there's just tons of videos of real police interrogations and interviews. And I mean, it's YouTube, Comments are a horrible place anyway, but just seeing this kind of armchair detective, armchair psychiatrist thing going on. And like the one thing that I was most conflicted about in stepping out of AAA was that I love working with actors. And for me, that's like telling a character based story, doing it with actors seems somewhat essential. Like I, I really lean into that. But knowing that making an indie game off of my savings in 12 months, I wasn't going to have $5 million to spend on motion capture and high-end character models and stuff. This isn't a big movie production. This is, if this is supposed to look like this real footage, this is like one camera in this bare room. I'd worked with Viva on my previous, the Legacy of Kane project. Uh, so I knew that I'd, really enjoyed working with her and that she would be interested in a role like this. So that kind of really rapidly coalesced. How did you decide on such short segments? You know, I had the high level idea of searching through a video database of interviews and it being word based. I then did a prototype where I uh, found these transcripts of this case. I think a kid called Porco and there were like five interviews with the police and these transcripts were, were online in the public interest and so I downloaded them all and I stripped the questions out and, and tried this idea that we will only hear each answer to the question will be the thing that we get access to um, and it was really fun like I didn't know anything about this case and so I was exploring it through the mechanic it just worked and showed that because you have that adversarial relationship where the person answering the questions is trying not to say too much and is being succinct and there is subtext there and they're lying to these people and also to themselves. It naturally created this interesting gameplay of reading between the lines um, and extracting maximum possible subtext. And then the, the kind of knock on for that was that actually your frequency of interaction is pretty high, which makes it feel more immersive. Uh, I think someone compared it to a slot machine, and it, it, it is like you're just watching clips, thinking of ideas, and you rapidly build up more ideas of what to search for than you can deal with, and so it really fuels this pace. And so it was a completely an accidental discovery. It was very much, I looked at some real transcripts, and when you pull out people's answers, they're pretty terse and short, and that was interesting to me because it really did make you think and analyze what they were saying and worry about the performance. And then, like I say, I think a lot of the success came out of the pace that that gave you. So as much as this is a weird, abstract experiment, it's actually very interactive. And there are AAA games where the frequency of your interactions is way less, right? There's a lot more sitting and not doing things or not even, you know, or interacting on a very minimal level running and shooting and doing stuff, but without actually engaging and thinking in a way that, that her story allows you to. So that was definitely a kind of happy accident. Why does it take place in the 1990s? So that initial spark of like why it was video was me spending a lot of time on YouTube looking at true crime stuff. And so the original idea was to situate it in that world. Um, but then when I started working on the story and, and I was, I became aware that I was pulling in a lot of stuff about these women in my family from previous generations. So a lot of that 
heavy gothic tone a lot of the plot elements were drawn from their lives in that world and it didn't 100 percent feel contemporary it felt like some of the constraints on those women's lives that were interesting to me weren't what we would see in the current situation so it felt like it needed to be a period piece and really pushing pushing the framing narrative back into the 90s felt sufficiently like we've knocked it back into the last century it felt like it gave sufficient kind of distance that now it, it, it felt more comfortable and so yeah it was that was pretty much the motivation it was less about a kind of nostalgia for that time which i think at that point there was i guess because of the age of various developers there was a lot of kind of interesting nostalgia for that aesthetic and for that time and it was yeah once i committed to that time period then i did kind of really dig into that and uh, really got into the aesthetic of the, the videotape making sure that was very authentic digging into all of the kind of cultural touch sense like i'd watch a lot of music videos from the different time periods to just kind of get my head in the space of uh, those time periods i bought a reasonably cheap kind of consumer video camera to shoot with and but i found that even that was coming out looking too good and i really didn't want to because you know at that time the the kind of retro video aesthetic was very popular and you know most even kind of consumer movie packages would have like the the vhs look tick box and you'd tick it and you'd kind of get a bit of it but I wanted it to look more real than that. So I went out to buy a bunch of kind of VCRs and everyone would look at me weird and be like, why are you buying this? You know, what do you want this for? If you got some weird old family tapes or something? And I was like, no, nah, it's for a project. So I bought a stack of them and kind of wired them all up. So there was this kind of Oribus loop where you would record on this and then it would play and record on this one and then play back into this one. So it kind of cycled and with each each re-recording the quality would kind of dip and you'd get some of those beautiful imperfections it was like a really fun process because you couldn't control it explicitly so you know i would just set it running come back in a few hours and would have a new bunch of footage so i couldn't say i really want this nice tear to happen here you would just watch it and be like oh i guess that's where the weird glitch and tear is going to happen one of the competitive advantages you have as an indie developer is you can be a bit more obsessive and spend more time on things than you would ever be allowed to if you're working for the man. So I knew that like, if I was going to do this weird thing, which felt very simple as a pitch, like you just sit and type words and watch video clips, by putting in an extra amount of effort, the user knows, oh, they didn't just do this because it's cheap they've put effort into this so making sure that the the look of the footage was really authentic putting in extra stuff like some of the post-process effects on the video on the sc computer screen and the glare and all those kind of effects just making sure that the there was richness to this simple idea that it was clear that i had done this for specific reasons and gone to town on it rather than like oh i'll do this because it's easy what are your thoughts on Bandersnatch? I think the cool thing with Bandersnatch is that it's probably been the one that has penetrated the cultural conversation the most. Uh, like for me, the the metaness of it and some of the simplicity is is not necessarily what I, the the perfect ideal version of that for me. But I think it really helps that if you're introducing a larger audience to this thing they get it uh, to some extent you're foregrounding the gimmick i guess the the next step will be to see if we can transition beyond that gimmick or if it um i think the biggest fear for me is that bandersnatch becomes the noun <laughs> like oh what are you up to i'm making a bandersnatch oh they're gonna bandersnatch doctor who next or they're doing yeah a, a verb or a noun i can almost see that happening obviously there is this huge interest now from tv and film companies because they're terrified that they're using losing their audience to phones uh, that they look at the timeshare and everyone's obsessed with with 
how much time of people they're stealing. Um, and they'll be like, wow, people used to sit and watch two, three hours of network TV a day. Now they're spending two hours on their phone and one hour of watching TV. And when they're watching that TV, it's on Netflix or wherever. And so there is this huge interest in finding a way to bring those people back, do something with kind of visual storytelling that is interactive. And obviously there is this, this huge tradition of it that most people are not aware of. So I know they're like the, the big drama in the game dev community was when Bandersnatch came out and it was being written up as the first of its kind. There are all these people like gritting their teeth going, no, oh, this has been happening since 19 whatever. Any advice for new interactive storytellers? I, I mean, the thing for me that still feels like there's this vacuum of uh, a variety of, of characters, interesting characters, like for the longest time, especially in the commercial world, we've been limited to a very small subset of character types and characters that we can talk about. That was a big thing for me with her story was like, I'm going to go and set something in the real world. And the main character here is this woman that is partly inspired by both of my grandmother's working class England and touch on these various reference points. And, you know, ultimately what interests me in any given story is the characters and their world being something interesting to me, something different, something that feels authentic. So, you know, for me, the starting point of any story is, is the characters and making sure that those are characters that I want to go on a journey with. And then beyond that, I think we're at a point where we're free to come up with mechanics around those characters. We're free to tell stories in a hundred different ways. Um, you know, I remember back working on Silent Hill where we had to, we made this decision to not have combat in the game, which at the time was such a controversial idea that you could tell a story without having the character stop to fight with shotguns every five minutes, right? Whereas now we're in a slightly more privileged position where I think the, the, the audience we have through mobile, through all the digital stores uh, is so varied and different. There isn't as much of an expectation around certain templates or game mechanics. So I think people are free to go out and have fun. And I, that was one of the cool things with, with her story was saying, look, if this, this very specific interesting thing can be an indie hit uh, and can penetrate uh, the conversation in this way, what other weird and interesting ideas are there out there uh, that we can kind of riff on? What are you making next? Currently working on what is essentially the sequel. And everything is very different. Um, I'm now working with a publisher, albeit Annapurna, who are a somewhat unconventional publisher. The budget and scale is, depending on how I account for it, <laughs> like tenfold, a hundredfold. All of the things that ended up being an advantage for her story, like it coming out of nowhere as far as people were concerned, it being so interesting and different and unique, it's a different world now. I, people know what her story is. So you have that kind of difficult second album syndrome. But it also is super empowering because I can say, well, look, her story worked. People loved these sensations. They loved this feel of this game. So with Telling Lies, I'm taking it in an even riskier place, more interesting place, and making more interesting decisions about how the gameplay works and the structure. So it's very much not replicating her story, but it's using that as a springboard to go and do something where the subject matter is even less video gamey, uh, where some of the abstractions in terms of how we present the live action is even more interesting and unconventional. A sensible business thing to do would have been to make two or three other her stories that very much replicated the formula. You know, there were people who were like, I loved her story. Just give me another case. Give me a different character in the seat. Let's go again. I want to do another one like this. This was really fun. And I think that when I start a project, it's usually there's some structural hook or gimmick that gets me excited because I feel like, oh, I've never built anything like this before. I haven't seen this before. And then that changes and becomes it becomes the story or the other aspects that then I kind of dig into. 
So I didn't want to just replicate that exactly. So I took a while sort of thinking around it, and there was this particular piece of story that I wanted to explore. And I think I thought about exploring it prior to her story as well and never really figured out an angle on it. And started to think about how I could build on the the her story concept to explore this story. And then started to come up with a list of, well, these are these are new things that I'm doing with this concept that are as risky as all the decisions I made for her story one, which feels exciting again to take risks and do things that are different. But, you know, they're bigger risks because I have some of the uh, support of her story success. I'm intrigued to see how the indie world response to it because it's still it's like a super indie thing it's still me making it and this time i have a slightly larger team so there's a core team of essentially two or three people making it the development budget is probably still in the indie world but it's going to have recognizable actors in it and the breadth and scope and color of the world in the footage is going to be way bigger it's an interesting one to figure out exactly how to package it but it is unquestionably just as if not more weird and complicated and strange as her story there is there is no world where i could travel back in time five years and pitch this to a publisher and they'd have been like oh sure we'd love to do this that was that was part of the the thing with going with annapurna was even when I pitched telling lies to Annapurna, I didn't sugarcoat it. I was like, look, this is this idea I want to do. It's pretty weird. This is, you know, warts and all, this is the idea. And these are some interesting decisions I feel like I should make. And they were cool with it. So the working with them didn't feel like it was kind of compromising the vision or, or selling out or anything. Um, it was just having an additional partner to work with who was super invested in the idea. What do you like about Indicade? Indicade, uh, of all the various festivals, was the one that for me had like the coolest mix of like the types of games that were being showed, the stuff you're seeing, the stages of development. Um, there's this great range of games, um, but also the uh, the social aspect and just that thing of like getting all the devs together in the same town, hanging out sharing stuff um i think indicate the thing that was most surprising and exciting to me was after years of working within a developer working for publishers where you know you're working on a game for years and you don't tell anyone about it and it's all trade secrets and ndas and there's a kind of uh competitiveness amongst devs as well because you're all like fighting over these scraps and you feel like you're all in competing with each other and then jumping into the indie world that doesn't exist really it's like you know the a rising tide lifts all boats so one indie game doing well helps all the others so suddenly being part of that world um, that for me was like the coolest thing beyond just the game getting out there and being uh, a good thing and I, and I think when i was applying to places I had a reasonably conservative budget. I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to travel to every show and I'm not going to do the shows where I have to pay a ton of money to, you know, get the banner and the booth space. Uh, Cause I was like my coming out of working in proper video games uh, and working with producers, I was very conservative with, <laughs> with all my financials. So I was like, I'm going to spend as little as possible making the game and my food budget will be very minimal. And yeah, in terms of showing the game and touring the game, yeah, I wasn't doing any of the shows where it was spend, you know, $10,000 to have a booth and print all the stickers and stuff. Cause I was like, I'm not even sure if her story works in that scenario, like asking people to come and sit down and spend a few minutes typing words into this police database. It was like, I'm not even sure you can show this. Uh, so yeah, Indicate was the one where, it was like the types of games you see there. There is a really interesting curation. Uh, you know, so to get into Indicate would be, you know, a step on the the route to 
acknowledging that this was a thing that was going to work, that was interesting. It's a badge of honor to show and say, look, you should pay attention to this game. Um, and yeah, it was one of those where it was, I knew I was going to get to meet interesting other devs and, and, you know, beyond just networking, just feel part of that world. If like me, you're a practical developer who's choosing which of the various shows and festivals to put your focus on, the curation with Indicate means that you're going to be alongside really cool, interesting projects that are going to you know, create an interesting mix. The usefulness of hanging out at Indicate from a social perspective, from a, we, we don't call it networking in indie games, right? But like just being around your peers, learning from them, all of that stuff. Um, like it, it really is this great sweet spot where it's just a really fun event. You're going to see cool games, meet cool people. Um, it has a a vibe that I think very much encapsulates that indie spirit of everyone being excited by each other's successes, willing each other to try new things, explore interesting avenues for, for kind of game development, um, but all with a smile on its face. What was it like winning the Grand Jury Award? The Grand Jury Prize... But Indicate was the first big win for her story. I remember I landed in LA on the day of Indicate, and I had a bunch of meetings in the morning and spent a lot of time in traffic between meetings and then came out of my last meeting and I had like an hour to get to Indicate and it, you're just hitting like rush hour in LA. And just remember looking around for my lift and no the traffic just wasn't moving and so then became this very fraught journey very slow stressful journey and made it just in time was ushered to my seat and I, so i was super jet lagged and tired and coming down off the adrenaline rush of la traffic and i was up for i think narrative was the award that if i won any i was thinking oh that would make sense my weird little narrative game um and so I think there was a point where the narrative prize went out and it didn't go to her story. And so then I was like, oh, okay, I can just relax now. So then I just kind of sunk down into my seat, got stuck into my beer. and was like, I'm just going to enjoy the evening now. All pressure is off. And then when it was announced for the Grand Jury Prize, it was one of those moments where I was like, did I hear right? Because if I step on stage now and I'm just hallucinating, I'm going to look like a complete idiot. Looked around and people seemed to have an expectation that I would get up. So I was like, okay, I think I heard right. And then gave some garbled speech uh, that I think referenced my jet lag. But yeah, no, that was like a big moment and really ushered in that kind of run for her story. And like I say, getting that kind of acknowledgement, especially of the, the kind of grand prize, setting up that it wasn't just this weird narrative thing. It, it, it had some significance and it kind of punched above its weight um, in an interesting way for an indie game that... Um, was really cool to see acknowledged. Also completely screwed up my travel plans because the cool thing, I don't, I don't, this is still a thing, but the the prizes you get, the the trophies you get at Indicate, um, these were special trophies, handmade, custom trophies for each prize. I was flying back out to the UK, meeting my family in the airport, and then flying on again for a vacation I think back into the States. It was a very complicated plan. And so I just had carry-on luggage. And so this custom trophy that I got uh, was a combination of circuit boards, copper wiring, and valves and clock faces. Um, and so I remember the moment where I'm approaching airport security and I have my carry-on luggage and I'm like, I'm going to take something out of this bag so that it's not a surprise when it goes through here. And I don't want to use the word but it might look like a device and just don't tase me or it, like, I'm going to take it out and show it to you. And they're just looking at it. I'm like, it's a, it's a video game trophy. And they're like, really? And I'm yeah. And they're like, well, what video game have you made? And I'm like, Oh, I made this game. That's about police interviews. And they're like, that doesn't even sound like a video game. So yeah, getting that trophy home was a, a fun challenge.